Welcome uh, to the National Endowment for Democracy. My name is Dave Peterson. I'm director of the Africa program here, and uh, I'm uh, privileged to uh, uh, welcome you and uh, start off uh, this uh, conference on Nigeria's Democracy at 20. Um, you can uh, join the conversation on Twitter, as you see here, following at uh, Ned Democracy at Yaga and at Ford Foundation. Use the uh, hashtag Ned Events. Um, we're really uh, privileged to have uh, here uh, to deliver uh, the introductory remarks uh, Ambassador uh, Linda Thomas Greenfield. Um, uh, I think she's very well known to uh, everyone here, and uh, there is a biography of her, so I won't go into it. I'll just uh, say that um, in addition to her uh, many uh, accomplishments uh, uh, as a diplomat, uh, she's also uh, our Africa expert on the um, uh, board of the National Endowment for Democracy, and so we're really uh, pleased that uh, she is uh, serving us uh, in that role. Um, and I think we're also very uh, privileged uh, to have her here uh, this morning uh, because I understand uh, she just had a medical emergency and so it's quite a relief uh, talking to her this morning. She's exuberant and uh, obviously in very good health and so uh, we're, we're happy about that too. <coughs> Uh, uh, so, uh, with uh, no further um, ado, Linda, uh, it's all yours. Good morning, everyone. Just to follow up, uh, there's something in your body called a gallbladder. Don't ignore it. <laughs> Uh, I did survive gallbladder surgery in, uh, in uh, New York uh, recently, and I thank all of you who sent me well wishes because it worked. I'm here to uh, tell the story. Uh, let me start by welcoming all of you here this morning for a discussion on 20 years of democracy in Nigeria. And I would argue that in addition to discuss, as I look at the agenda, we'll also dissect uh, Nigeria's democracy. We will constructively criticize, and I would also argue more importantly, we will celebrate 20 years of democracy in Nigeria. I think today this is more important that, than in any time in Nigeria's history, but also any time in Africa's history, and any time in the history of the globe as we look at many people questioning whether democracy is the right way for Africa uh, to move forward. And as people see many countries beginning to question uh, whether democracy is working for, for them. Uh, I would also note that as we look at our own country here in the United States, those questions become uh, even more important as we move forward. I hope that by the end of the day, we will leave here with a better understanding of Nigeria's challenges, of its promise for the future and how it can deliver prosperity and hope uh, for its largely young population in the decades to come. I first went to Nigeria in 1978. Uh, again, as a bright-eyed uh, young uh, graduate student from the University of Wisconsin. I was studying in Liberia, but how can you go to Africa and not go to Nigeria? And I spent about a month uh, touring the entire country, and I love to tell the story that I went from Liberia uh, to Ghana to uh, Togo, Benin, and crossed the border into Nigeria in a bush taxi. And in the Nigerian, in the taxi that I got into in Ghana, uh, the taxi driver took me in, and there were three other women, were four sitting in the back seat, and I was young enough and thin enough at that time that I could sit across the back seat with, with, with four. 
and uh, we drove across the border into Togo, and then we drove across the border into Benin, and nobody asked me for my passport. And then we got to the Nigerian border, and the immigration people demanded our passports, and I proudly pulled out my American passport and handed it, and everybody went into total silence because the other three women didn't have passports. Uh, they were illegally crossing the border into Nigeria to go to work, and the taxi driver, seeing me with my short uh, afro and dressed in African clothes, thought I was just another Ghanaian woman crossing the border to go into Nigeria to work as a domestic. So when I pulled out the passport, everybody went crazy, and I think they were all speaking in Yoruba, and they were pointing at me with anger, and when I finally realized what had happened, I wasn't supposed to have a passport. That meant that somebody had to stamp the passport, and they didn't have a stamp at this illegal border that we were crossing. <laughs> and so the taxi driver had to turn around and go across the legal border, which meant he had to pay more money uh, to get across the border so that I could get my passport stamped. So that was my first experience in going uh, to uh, Nigeria, and it's never left me. Uh, Gowan was the president uh, at that time, the military president, a young uh, uh, military guy, and Nigeria had just uh, ended a, a, a period of civil war, and Nigeria was questioning how it would move forward. Fast forward um, by a few years, I went back to Nigeria in 1984, as a foreign service officer, and the then president of uh, Nigeria was President Buhari. And so over the years, Nigeria had gone back and forth from one military government to, uh, to another. But eventually, it would move along the path and in the late 1990s became uh, a, civil, a civilian government with a uh, civilian-led uh, president. And it has had some fits and starts over those years. Uh, Nigeria has been recognized as the fourth largest democracy in the world and certainly the largest in Africa. I think it's a country with tremendous potential. And at the same time, what seems insurmountable challenges. But like all democracies, Nigeria's democracy is not perfect. It's a process. Democracy is a process. It's a process that is constantly evolving on a continuum of hope. Why do people support democracy? It's because they have hope that it will make a difference in their lives in the future. Nigeria's democracy, as I said, has had fits and starts. It's had successes and failures. And it has taken three steps forward, and, and it can as it takes those steps, and at the same time, two steps backward. But it continues to march forward nonetheless. Uh, it's our beacon of hope, not just for Nigerians, but for the entire continent. We regularly hear that when Nigerians sneeze, the continent gets a cold. When Nigeria's democracy falters, everybody gets nervous. When Nigeria has elections, everybody is on pins and needles watching what is happening in that country. So what I'd like to do in the short time that I have with you this morning is first talk about some of the positive trends in Nigeria's democracy, and I have five. I'll tell you about that, and then I'll share with you my assessment of the five greatest challenges. And I use something called the rule of five because it's all I can remember if for some reason my uh, papers are not in front of me. And I think for most people, it's all they want to suggest. If you start going beyond five, everybody starts challenging you. But this list is not exhaustive. Let me, uh, let me be clear. These are the five that I see. I could probably list 20 challenges and 20 positives. And I think we can all come up with different uh, things, but I'd like to share some of those with you. And, so, and some of the ones that I will list will be surprising to you. So let's start with the positives 
and we'll kind of end with the challenges. First and foremost for me, a positive is Nigeria's institutional infrastructure. That's surprising. Nigeria actually does have the infrastructure to support the democratic process. It has the courts. It has the electoral commission. It has the legislature. It actually has political parties that sometimes work for, for their people. And it has the administration that can work. Now, I will say they don't always work. Uh, they, too, have their fits and starts. But if you compare Nigeria to other countries on the, on the continent, no country can rival the infrastructure that Nigeria has. They have the capacity to support the democratic process. Sometimes the will is missing, but they have the capacity. If you look at how the INET functioned during the 2015 election, and I was there as an observer and met many of, uh, of you from Nigeria uh, as we were observing that process. If you look at how the INEC functioned, INEC delivered what everyone in Nigeria and in the world thought uh, was a free and fair election. It was recognized internationally. It led to the first time Nigeria transferring power from the ruling party to the opposition. And the ruling party didn't contest the election. That's the kind of infrastructure that makes for uh, great elections and that supports democracy. Second, and I probably should have listed this one first, Nigeria has committed voters. I have never seen anything like what I saw when I was there in 2015, getting up at 6 o'clock in the morning and going to polling stations and seeing hundreds, thousands of people lined up uh, to vote. And not just to vote, but lined up to be registered, uh, I, I can't remember the term, but uh, certified to vote in the particular place that they were voting. So they had to line up for hours to get certified, then they had to line up for hours to vote, and then they stayed to wait for their votes to be counted. And when I talk to people, I'm like, why are you giving your whole day? And it's like, I gotta make sure that my vote is counted. Committed voters, people who are willing to sacrifice their time and their lives to ensure that they get to vote and that their votes are counted. Now, I will argue, and I think we are aware, and many of you certainly, that sometimes their votes are not counted in the way that they expect their votes to be counted, and sometimes uh, they don't uh, get the candidate that they hope uh, that uh, they would get, but it's not discouraging to them. They still show up, and they still vote, and they vote in large, large numbers. When I look at uh, what happens in the United States, and particularly uh, when we have local elections, uh, we're lucky if we get a 20% showing uh, in, in local elections. Uh, uh, we get a bigger showing on, on our national elections, but nothing like what I've seen on the continent of Africa. Never seen long lines at voting polls in the United States like I've seen in Africa. So committed voters are important uh, to uh, a democracy. Um, it shows that they have confidence in the process even when the process doesn't work for them. And eventually, that will, will pay off for them. Third, a, a young, youthful population. Nigeria's uh, medium age, and uh, sometimes figures get mixed up in my head, I think it's 17 for, uh, for Nigeria. Um, Nigeria has a very young uh, population. Uh, the not too young to run legislation was a real accomplishment. And that was accomplished because young people in Nigeria, like many of you here in this room, were willing to push that agenda forward. And it exhibited the impact that young people 
in Nigeria can have on the electoral process. The fact that they were organized and advocated for this successful legislation has huge implications for Nigeria in the future because it means that they are politically engaged. It means that they want to be part of the process. And it means that they will be significant uh, voters uh, in the process in the future. The fourth one for me is financial means. And I'll come back to that in, uh, uh, on the other side. So unlike many countries in Africa, the Nigerian government has the financial means to pay for elections. Some countries can't deliver elections. Now I'm not talking about will here, I'm talking about money. When you look at the billions of Naira required to carry out an election in thousands of polling uh, places, no other country on the continent has the means to do that. Now, occasionally the government won't deliver the money. Uh, occasionally they don't deliver at all. But they have the means to carry out these elections. And when I look at what, again, what happened in 2015, uh, when the commitment was there and the money, although late, uh, was provided, uh, we saw the impact that that had on a, a free and fair election. Um, that said, it has sometimes been difficult uh, for the Electoral Commission, particularly in the 2019 election, uh, to get the funds from the government uh, to actually carry out a free and fair process. And occasionally, the government uses its ability to pay to influence how the Electoral Commission uh, performs. But that said, the money is there to carry out what is an extraordinarily expensive process. Uh, I've never really uh, delved into what it costs to have elections in, in the United States. Uh, I assume uh, that it's equally expensive and we have the means to carry out these elections. They're usually done, however, at the local level. Uh, but in Nigeria, it's the national level that has to come up with that money. And uh, they do have that money. Finally, and this one will not surprise you, Nigeria has an active, a proactive, and very effective civil society. Many countries don't have the kind of civil society organizations uh, that uh, exist in Nigeria. Organizations like Yaga and some of, uh, and many of you who are here in the room have made a major contribution uh, to the successes that Nigeria has made in its efforts to consolidate democracy. Nigeria has a strong civil society infrastructure that has been, in my view, relentless in pushing for more transparent and fair elections. Uh, what you're doing here today contributes to the impact that civil society can have on a country like Nigeria. And I think all of you uh, should be proud of what you have achieved. There's so much more that uh, needs to be done, uh, but based on what I have witnessed from uh, the commitments that you've made, the work that you've done over many, many years, Nigeria has uh, achieved far more uh, because of your commitment, your uh, proactive engagement with the population, your education of, uh, of the voter, uh, your uh, pressure on the government to deliver on democracy for the people. So those are my five positives that contribute to Nigeria's electoral process. Let's turn to the challenges. Interestingly, I, I talked about in the positives, youth. But youth is a challenge as well. Youth and women's participation in the electoral process has not achieved the levels that it should in Nigeria. And while the Not Too Young to Run campaign was successful, the next step is getting young people and women to, to run and get elected. And that continues to be difficult in Nigeria. I was uh, in a meeting with former president of Liberia, President Sirleaf, and we were talking about women's engagement in the political process in Liberia, but across the continent of Africa. And she noted 
that Nigeria has the lowest level of women's participation in the electoral process, or it, women in elected positions uh, uh, than many countries in Africa. Uh, small percentage in the legislature, I think there are no women, uh, I'm not sure there ever been a woman governor in uh, Nigeria, there have been some deputy uh, governors. There were two women running uh, for, for president uh, in uh, opposition, um, but uh, didn't get very far in the process, despite the fact that I would argue uh, at least one of them was more qualified than any of the candidates running. Um, but it's hard for women and, and, and young people to get involved in politics because Nigerian politics is still an old man's club. And I stress the old part of it, and I stress the man part of it. And without the anointment of one of these old godfathers, young people and women have a difficult time breaking into the political arena in Nigeria. Those who are successful are unfortunately uh, beholding, uh, beholden to, to the godfathers and really not able to step outside the umbrella uh, that their godfathers uh, provide for them. So addressing them, uh, this challenge uh, will require a concerted effort by young people and by women, by civil society, to come together across regional and ethnic lines to challenge the old guard. Uh, and they're not going to sit back and, and let you win. It's not going to be an easy task uh, to, to challenge the, the, the old guard and the old system uh, because they control, uh, they control the money. Second, Challenge I see is the ethnic and regional allegiances that define uh, Nigeria's uh, politics. These cleavages continue to divide populations and have hampered uh, the process across the political spectrum. Uh, the gentleman's uh, arrangement by the former ruling party to alternate between the North and South uh, worked until it failed. And we'll see what happens in, in the next election, how that gentleman's uh, agreement uh, will, uh, uh, will continue to operate. And I think that election is going to be a challenging one uh, for uh, Nigeria, uh, whether the gentleman's arrangement uh, will, uh, will hold up. Um, because it hasn't, in my view, served the interests of, uh, of the Nigerian people. Third on my list, and this won't surprise you, is corruption. There's not much I, I can say here other than the fact that Nigeria's potential uh, as a democracy, but its potential also uh, to be the economic powerhouse in the region has been hampered by decades of corruption. Transparency International still rates Nigeria 144 of 180 on the corruption index. And while I guess not being 180 is good, 144 is not great. Uh, and the role that corruption plays in the political process uh, has been obvious over many, many years. I won't go any farther on that one. I talked about in the positives, Nigeria having the financial wherewithal to pay for elections. On the other side of this, elections are expensive in Nigeria for those who are running. Uh, in the United States, voters contribute to the candidates. Uh, for all of those of you in the audience, you get your regular emails and phone calls from the Democratic Party, from the Republican Party, from candidates asking you to make uh, contributions. And the contributions can be as small as $25 and as large as, as uh, $2,500 uh, for an individual. Uh, the number is somewhere around there. Uh, but there are ways to even contribute more if you have uh, greater resources. So we contribute to the candidates. In Africa, it's the opposite. To run for an election, a candidate has to have a lot of money to contribute to the voters. They buy their votes. Uh, people regularly uh, admit that quietly, 
hardly ever admitted in public, but we see it. Uh, whether it's handing out in, in Liberia five li Liberian dollars uh, to a voter, and we used to say to Liberians, your vote is more valuable than five Liberian dollars. Or as I heard in a Kiti state uh, during the election that people were being given thousands of naira uh, to show up to vote. And while sometimes people would take money and vote how they want it, now because of the electronic technological age we're in, people are told you got to take a picture of your vote to prove that you earned the amount of money that they gave you. So to run for an election, you got to have money in your pocket to hand over to your voters to prove to your voters that you will take care of them. That's impossible for a lot of young people, a lot of women uh, to, uh, to do. So that limits the abilities of many people to, um, uh, to participate in the political process. If you don't have money to run in Nigeria, you're just not in the political game. And if you don't have money of your own, then you're going to need a godfather, one of the, the, the old guard to pay for you. And then that compromises your ability to do what you commit uh, to do for the people who are voting for you. Finally, in Nigeria, and I think uh, this uh, has been a problem across the continent of Africa, in elections, there's always the potential for violence. Uh, in 2015, good luck, Jonathan, and he needs to be given credit for this, said no one should die because they want to vote. And while there, there was some violence uh, in 2015, it was extraordinarily uh, low compared to previous years. In 2019, uh, Nigeria made a huge step backward. Uh, there was much more violence. I was looking online yesterday and I saw that about 30 people were uh, killed. Um, according to some of the reports I saw, I suspect the number was even higher. Uh, violence in elections hamper the ability of democracy to thrive because it promotes fear. And as Good Luck Jonathan said, people should not die because they want to vote. And it's the government's responsibility, generally the ruling party, to provide the security that is needed uh, for people to get out to vote. So we see that there are challenges but there are opportunities for democracy uh, in Nigeria. Let me conclude by saying that there is tremendous anxiety about Nigeria's democracy, but at the same time, I see overwhelming hope for Nigeria to succeed. Nigeria is an example to the region. It's an example for the continent, but it is also an example that we look at globally. Nigeria's failure, failure will have tremendous impact on the region, just as its success is seen as encouraging uh, to the region. As you look back on Nigeria's 20 years, I encourage you to look for the silver lining. Don't focus on the negative. If you're focusing on the negative, look at how you can turn that negative into a positive. The silver lining is what we want to build on. It's what we want to learn from so that Nigeria can continue to make steps forward. We know that if democracy is to succeed uh, in Nigeria and elsewhere, it also has to be more inclusive. And I know that's one of the panels that uh, uh, you will be discussing that issue today. Democracy has to be about the people and not the leaders. And there's a tendency for democracy to focus on the leaders in many countries, including our own today. Democracy has to be futuristic in terms of looking at how uh, it will uh, change the lives of the next generation, how it will make the next generation's uh, uh, lives better and what politicians have to do today 
to ensure that democracy thrives tomorrow. I look forward to hearing the results of your discussion today. Let me say, as I said when I started, this is an important discussion. It's, it is an important discussion, not just for Nigeria, but an important discussion for every democracy on the continent of Africa and across the world that it's grappling with the kinds of issues that you and Nigeria are continuing to grapple with today. So again, I wish you the best of luck and I wish Nigeria the best of luck as it continues to march forward in its own democratic process. Thank you very much. My name is Carl Levan. I'm a professor at American University and um, I'm going to introduce the panel and talk a little bit about uh, my memories of the time immediately after the transition and the markers that I used to think about uh, Nigeria's democratic and developmental progress and setbacks. Um, to my uh, far left uh, is Samson Idoto from uh, Yaga Africa, a group that I got to know a few years ago and has done tremendous work and is certainly a part of that vibrant civil society that Ambassador Thomas Greenfield uh, just characterized for us. Um, to his right, we have Ayo Obe, um, who is a legal practitioner, and I think through her comments will be able to tell us a little bit more about um, her work and her perspectives um, on, the, uh, pers on, on Nigeria's democratic development. Um, to my immediate right is um, my old mentor and friend, uh, uh, Egosa Osage, um, who was my tutor of sorts when I spent time at the University of Ibadan many years ago, and I have a, a few stories about that. And then uh, to his right, um, we have Clement Nwankwo, um, who I also got to know uh, even before I met uh, Egosa, and who was a very important figure in the struggle for democracy in the 1990s, um, and I got to know him in that context and who has continued to be a strident voice within civil society and has been able to negotiate um, circles, I think, um, at all levels of society, that he has really kept his feet deeply grounded in the grassroots, even as he's able to uh, poke people in power in the stomach uh, when necessary. So, um, as I said, my name's Carl Levan, and what I want to do is um, begin with uh, just a few very brief thoughts about what I saw as a young person coming to Nigeria a few months after the transition when I was hired to work with the National Assembly. And just to give you a sense of um, what our benchmarks are and uh, what ghosts have maybe come back to haunt Nigeria and also how things have changed. One thing that was extraordinary at the time was that uh, the National Assembly in the House and the Senate, 82% of the members had no prior electoral experience. So the average age in the House of Representatives was 43, and hardly any of those members knew anything about what it meant to be a representative. There were about 16 and a half years where government was understood to be something that was a problem in your life and something that was interfering with your economic uh, mobility or economic vitality and certainly your political freedom. Um, there was a tremendous moment of optimism and some of this optimism was perhaps unrealistic. Uh, the first round of Afrobarometer, which was a new survey project that was just being launched at the same time of the transition. There were about 80% of Nigerians who thought that their life was going to economically get better within the next year or so. That is a very, very short period of time and very, very high, high hopes for a country that faced the, the tremendous challenges that Nigeria did at the time. And politically um, and economically, there were a number of uh, major challenges that the transition had left over. Uh, Ambassador Thomas Greenfield mentioned, you know, some of these uh, bargains and deals about the rotation of power between the North and the South. This is something that I detailed quite a bit for my last book, Contemporary Nigerian Politics, my most recent book. Um, and 
there was tremendous doubt and uncertainty about whether the civilians could actually control the military. And this manifested itself in, um, in contradictory ways. In 2000, uh, Obasanjo, who was himself a former dictator, fired in one day about 150 Air Force officers. Um, there were several other similar purges. These purges were not really ethnic purges, importantly. They were uh, supposedly motivated by people who had demonstrated some sort of political ambition, and so the idea was to remove these people from the military. But uh, there was also a truth commission uh, whose truth has never been heard, the Oputa panel. Uh, its findings to this day remain secret. This is one of those ghosts um, that continues to hamper the rule of law that more and more civil society activists are returning to. Civil society um, was going through uh, a tremendous internal soul-searching and internal dialogue among itself. An entire generation had grown up on the streets protesting structural adjustment, neoliberal retrenchment, and then the human rights violations and the uh, great political um, controversy surrounding the annulment of the 1993 elections. And it took them a few years to reorient themselves about what it might mean to work with elected representatives and to formulate what their agendas might be. What I saw from inside the National Assembly was a tremendous mistrust. It took probably two electoral cycles before members of the National Assembly would really start to see people in civil society as worthy of their attention or expertise or alliances. Um, and this was also a period where, uh, despite the purging of the military and so forth, um, there were other uh, contradictory attitudes that the ruling party at the time, the People's Democratic Party, embraced. One was that the military budget um, in 1998 was about $790 million. By 2002, it was $2.2 billion. Massive increase in the military budget. Now, keep in mind, this takes place before the Niger Delta militancy uh, takes off, long before there were troubles with Boko Haram, and obviously well before the current troubles with uh, pastoralism. Um, and so this was part of a, a deal to um, uh, keep the military at bay and to keep them happy. Um, I and others have referred to this as coup proofing. And uh, you know, this is happening at a time where Abuja, the capital, was a radically different place in many ways than it is today. You could drive around the city at any time of day or night by yourself. Um, if you didn't have plans for the weekend, you could hop in your car and drive up to Kaduna. Uh, as a young man, one of the first things I learned to say was uh, Inaso Gudur Dan Allah, to ask for a, uh, a, a beer um, in Kano, after Kano had passed Sharia law. Of course, it was not difficult to find a beer because we just, I learned that you need to find Sabongari. Um, and th this is what Nigeria was like. Um, and it's, it's very easy to look at the changes in security merely as a, uh, a law enforcement problem or some sort of tremendous step backwards, but that sort of physical insecurity has also come to condition social anxiety and, uh, and the abbreviating of people's time horizons as they think about their economic futures and their economic investment and it impedes the entrepreneurship that everyone, I think, sees as a tremendous advantage. And so, you know, the civil society activists at the time who were, you know, embracing this optimism and making these adjustments about what their predisposition to the government should be were people like Richard Akinola, uh, who told me stories of just a year or two prior driving through the, states of the state of Lagos, the city of Lagos, and throwing newspapers off the back of trucks onto street corners, newspapers that would criticize the military. And they had to do it this way because if, if you didn't do it at four in the morning, you might get caught and tortured. And now we have um, civil society almost coming back full circle with a tremendous amount of concern coming from PLOC and other groups about the 
incapacity of the rule of law and, the, uh, and deep, deep questions about whether um, people's physical integrity is really being respected. So thinking about more than just representation and democracy, more than just a system for maybe economic uh, delivery and enabling participation is actually the physical rights of integrity and human rights of the person. So um, I'm really pleased that uh, we have this uh, panel to reflect on you know, the years past and the challenges that we're now facing. I already hinted at some of the um, uh, insecurity challenges. Um, and I also witnessed the 2019 elections and would uh, share some of Ambassador Thomas's Greenfield's concerns about uh, the state of electoral democracy in Nigeria. Never before had people been so willingly open to bribing voters in front of my own face. Usually there had been a great deal of subterfuge to hide it. And um, there was no effort to hide it in February 2019 in Lagos, which had the lowest electoral turnout of any state in the country, 18%. Um, in contrast to Katsina and a few others where it was over 50%, which is still somewhat low. And so the, the challenges um, you know, that remain are, um, are tremendous. 2019 certainly was um, a step back of sorts. And so we need to think about how we might harness the capacity of those democratic institutions that uh, Ambassador Thomas Greenfield identified, because that capacity is real. And I think what Nigerians have learned, just as Americans are learning, is that the institutions do not speak for themselves, and the institutions do not fight for themselves. And so this is where civil society is coming again to the aid of democracy and to the aid of participation and pushing young people and women back onto uh, or onto the platform for the first time and putting human rights back onto the platform um, as they must be and to put inclusive economic growth onto the uh, platform of uh, government policy. And I think it, the struggle continues. And so um, I, I really look forward to hearing the comments from the panel about um, the successes in the struggle and what uh, is next on your agenda. So. Uh, with those promptings, we could certainly uh, go in order um, of, of the, but if anybody wants to jump in first, if I've sufficiently provoked someone, then I'm happy to open it up. That's fine. We'll go. Okay. So Professor Osage, please, from the University of Ibadan. Thank you very much. Um, I think that, you know, we must be reminded, you know, that in all of these discussions, we need to have some perspective. Um, we need to be able to locate our discussions um, within particular frameworks. Here I'm reminded first of, you know, the um, whole idea of how to not only spread the democracy um, fever in the positive sense, but also how to deepen it and consolidate it. And so S.P. Huntington was interested in how do you cross the threshold um, if you're transiting from an authoritarian regime, for instance? And so he says, if you have two consecutive successful elections. Now, Nigeria has had six consecutive successful elections, which means it has crossed the threshold. And um, there's every reason to believe that democracy has um, become deeper and a little more consolidated. The only problem with that, of course, is that elections are only a necessary part of democracy. They are not sufficient you know, for democracy. The second thing is, a long time ago when we were thinking of how to sell democracy um, to people who had become accustomed to authoritarian ways and cultures, you had to think of incentives and there was a popular perspective that tied democracy to development. You know, so there was a democracy development nexus, meaning that if you had democracy on a sustained basis, then chances were that you could have um, increased development. You know, so again, for many people, the expectations, the hopes you know, that were built into the democratic outburst in Nigeria 
um, derived from the expectations that democracy would yield several dividends. And I think that, you know, um, we need to remember that all the time, you know, that what makes democracy legitimate, what sustains it, and what really endears it at the end of it all, um, what's going to ensure above everything else, is that the people think that democracy is capable of delivering, you know, on those expectations. Now, I think that within the context, we can talk about the positives, the way the ambassador did, and there are many of them. I mean, we've had not only elections, we've had even alternations. I mean, it's been possible to unseat incumbents. Um, we've had that once at the federal level, but, you know, in legislative elections, in gubernatorial elections in the states and so on, several people um, have come and, you know, been defeated you know, and this with minimum violence. And so there is something about smooth succession that gives hope, you know, that the democratic culture is getting deeper and deeper. Um, I also think that the political parties themselves have become a lot more consolidated um, in spite of the um, problems that continue to confront them all the time. Um, they haven't become quite as democratic as, you know, people would expect them to be um, for reasons that I think, you know, this is a little aside. When you're behavioral in your analysis, you must ask who these politicians are. And I see that they belong to a class of very special people that have been described as army brought ups. Army brought ups meaning people who um, grew up knowing only about the military and his authoritarian ways. And some of them were deliberately, you know, um, recruited and co-opted into becoming critical members of a political class, you know, by um, those several acts of very devious military transitions. But we do have, you know, army brought ups um, in large numbers, and it is they that have, you know, won several elections. And so many of the things that we see wrong, even in the political parties, we can attribute to their origins and the kinds of cultures that they have imbibed over time. Now, I also think that um, in a real sense, civil society has continued to thrive, um, albeit you know, within very constrained um, conditions. We have strong reason to believe you know, as the ambassador said, <coughs> that the institutions are getting, you know, more consolidated, yeah, even with the problems that they have. It is possible to talk at the federal level, especially, that there is some semblance of some separation of power, you know, um, that there is, you know, um, legislative check and some balance on the executive. Um, the judiciary, you know, has not been that fortunate, um, but we do have instances of judicial activism um, which give hope, you know, that the judiciary may be bloodied, but it is not given up. So I think that is, that is quite useful. Um, but I want to focus on something that we don't ordinarily do when we discuss, you know, issues of assessment. We, we seem to forget that Nigeria is a federal system and most often the focus is on the federal government and um, if you listen to the ambassador we see all those things about leadership and the expectations and so on they're built around the federal government um, but there are 36 state governments in Nigeria there are 774 local governments in Nigeria and the real Nigerians, there are no unreal Nigerians, but the real Nigerians are to be found in these states and in these localities. And so if, if democracy is to be meaningful in any sense, if democracy is to yield any dividends, if democracy is to be what people expect it to be, we should pay um, equal attention to democracy at the state and local levels. And I dare say that, you know, um, at the state level, uh, there is quite a bit of work, you know, um, that democracy has to do. 
Um, I'm sure my colleagues you know, on this panel would know that there has been very little engagement. Well, not so little, uh, but in relation to the engagement with the federal government, we have shied away a bit from state governments. Now, do political parties exist in the states? Do they exist in the local government? Um, um, do we have checks and balances? Are the institutions also that strong at the state level? Um, are the states you know, able to perform as you know, um, agencies of development? We have several problems with the states. Um, we cannot talk in any meaningful way about separation of power, for instance, at the state level because the Houses of Assembly uh, just simply have muffled voices. Um, in many states, they just don't exist. Now, um, the judiciary is probably faring worse at the state level than it is at the federal level, um, because you know, many state governors are simply the, um, the godfathers of the states, and they have those states as their private empires, almost. The political parties are also in the hands of the state governments. Um, the state governor you know, personifies the political party. So we do have serious problems there. The only, for me, relief is that in terms of what we have learned you know, from previous democratic situations in the country, we have had fewer instances of impeachment, um, both at the state and local levels. Um, I think in a long time, it's the impeachment of the deputy governor of Kogi State that took place um, last week, um, you know, that took us back to that era when impeachment was such a critical um, aspect of... Plateau um, State. Plateau State, you know, um, and so on. But overall, I think going forward, um, there, there, there are two major areas I want to focus on. The first, of course, is the youth. And we've talked about the youth being um, not only an embodiment of the uh, possibilities, but even um, the hope that the country has in the future. Now, is there a special place for the youth in, in democracy, um, theoretically, or even in practice? I think that you know, the youth will be the foot soldiers, you know, the, the, the agents the, you know, that will mobilize you know, um, along the lines of all the things that we've talked about. Um, whether it is you know, voter efficacy, it it's, it's devolves on the youth, or you know, um, the other big problems. But what have we done with the youth in the country? They have become perhaps the most frustrated you know, stratum of, of society um, because they are at the receiving end you know, of the incapacitation of you know, government to deliver on many of those expectations. The schools, especially the universities and the public schools, are badly run and they have all run down. Um, employment continues to be a major challenge. You know, people leave school and they cannot find jobs to do. Um, Health care is, 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 is not, so, um, um, not so good. Um, the road infrastructure, public transportation, all of these things, the, the kinds of things that you would expect, you know, government to at least launch its citizens with. Um, those things are a little problematic. The final point, of course, is insecurity. And that's the greatest challenge, you know, that the democracy of the country now faces. And insecurity is not simply um, about the capacity of the federal government only. It's also to do with the state governments. So that's why I think, you know, we need to look the way of state governments and local governments to see how we can grow capacities to deal with the issues of insecurity. And, and I think that insecurity has become such a major industry that cuts across virtually all the problems that we can ever think about in the country. Think for one minute what governors do in the name of security votes and how security votes are votes that you know, they don't have to account for. Um, that's a big deficit on accountability, but it takes a lot of the resources in the country. And I also think, and this is the final point, 
that we are becoming so dependent on the military uh, in many of these areas because of the growing problems of insecurity. That the time, you know, it's probably going to come, if not now, but in the very near future, when we have to rethink civil-military relations in terms of, you know, subordination to civil authority. I'll stop there. Okay. So um, before I uh, ask uh, Samson Etodo from Yaga to react to the youth uh, who's uh, been invoked, I, I want to react to a few things that you said. Um, legislative checks at the federal level, you're correct, they do remain very real. And, there was, and one of the think, most recent examples of that was about two years ago when President Buhari went to the National Assembly to ask for a billion naira to buy weapons. And the Senate did something very interesting. They said no. And this was unexpected. Um, and they laid out a reasonable set of demands about why they thought that borrowing money and this was not going to be a useful strategy. Your comment about um, getting people to believe that dem democracy will deliver is also very important because I remember when Obasanjo came in, he was haunted by comments that he made in 1984 after Buhari's coup, where he said people are more interested in the delivery of government than in the form of government. And um, everyone has forgotten those comments, <laughs> but at that time it was something that really animated the perspective about Obasanjo's behavior and whether he was a military person in civilian uh, garb. But uh, Samson, would you like to reflect on the youth dimension? Um, thank you very much, Carl. Can you hear me? Yeah. So uh, as we as we sit in this room to reflect, there's a guy called Fisayo Soyombo, who is a young Nigerian, um, who over the last two weeks has demonstrated patriotism um, by exposing the corruption and the rot in our criminal justice system. He went as an undercover, got into the prison, got arrested, and over the last um, two weeks, there have been revelations published by The Cable, which is a prominent online media, exposing this rot in the system. What does he get in return? It's a society that not only intimidates, but attempts to take his life. And that's just one young Nigerian who, out of patriotism, decided to expose the rot in our system. As we speak, there is a Shore who has been in detention for close to three months just because he decided to mobilize Nigerians to speak out under the revolution now. As we sit, we have Jalingo Abba, who is a young journalist who exposed corruption in Cross River State, but is currently under detention. In fact, um, brought to the court by the prison service in chains. As we speak, we've got Dadiata for close to 49 days. No one knows where Dadiata is. These are all young Nigerians who are contributing their own quota towards expanding the space. But what does what we call democracy gives them in return? It's either unlawful arrest or, or detention. And so for a lot of young Nigerians, when we hear academics and policymakers talk about democratic consolidation, to a lot of Nigerians it makes no meaning, particularly young Nigerians. It doesn't make any meaning because we've got a society that does not um, respect the dignity of the human person or sees young people as, as <coughs> stakeholders in the process. And that is a conversation that we need to have and we need to, we need to expand. The, the second critical point around the consolidation of democracy, I'm talking about institutions, is the fact that we've got institutions that are not only weak, um, but today, 
if you look at the legislature, um, in 1999, and by the way, I never fought for democracy, um, but, I, but I inherited um, and also learning from um, those who fought for democracy, that we, we, we had a national assembly um, over the last few years that called, called the bluff of the executive. Um, but today, you've got young Nigerians who were voting for the first time in the 2019 elections, who are seeing a legislature that could not debate um, the medium-term expenditure framework mm -hmm. that was presented to the National Assembly. Um, but it was just passed, and we're going to have a budget that's going to be passed by a legislature that um, cannot call the bluff of the executive. And so when we talk about checks within the democratic system, if you look through from 1999 to where we are, it does appear these institutions, this agents of protection that should protect our democracy um, have been um, decimated. And, and so that's, that's a big source of, um, source of concern um, for, for me. There are three checks in a democratic system that limits either the powers of the executive or um, institutions. One is the parliament, two is the media, and then third is civil society. And as, as was shared in a meeting we were yesterday, you're beginning to see the clamp down on civil society activists as well as um, regulation of, <coughs> of the NGO space, uh, which many people will think um, that civil society is, um, is against um, the regulation of, um, of the NGO space, which I, I don't really think is the case, but it's actually a strategy used by the state um, to close the civic space. And the civic space is, um, is shrinking. There are three points I'd like to um, flag in terms of where we, where, we, where we are going to and what we should do. First is there's a collapse of unionism um, as well as social movements who are providing um, either leadership development for upcoming activists um, as well as mentorship. Because uh, if you look through the generations of, of Clements and and the Husseini Abduls and the Ezenwa who are here, um, as well as um, Ayo. Uh, if you look through our, our tertiary institutions today, we don't have vibrancy in our student union governments. And those student union governments are a platform for building leadership um, capital on young people, because that's a breeding ground where young people transit into mainstream politics. And so we need to establish that connection between um, are uh, former activists or who are still activists um, who are in the movement um, with young people who are in, in tertiary institutions. The second and also very, very critical is how do we establish a mechanism of accountability between um, civil society activists who transit into mainstream politics um, because We've seen an incursion of civil society actors who have gone into um, um, politics over the last 20 years. And the critical question is how have they performed and what sort of accountability mechanism exists between those who are in civil society as well as um, those who are in the political space. And it's very, very important um, that um, we reflect um, deeply on, on that. Uh, and the last point is about the recklessness the recklessness of the political class. Um, and I think it's important that we look at what mechanisms exist to address this recklessness. Because you have these institutions in place, where you have these laws in place, but you have a very um, reckless political class that seeks to undermine um, the institutions as well as the electoral process. And you saw that during the, during the 2019 elections. But to address this is a question of mobilizing a critical mass of Nigerians. And where are those organizations today um, who in the past could mobilize um, people to the streets to demand um, accountability or chase the military to the barracks? There are a couple of organizations, but we need to invest more in, in mobilizing citizens 
And I think that for us in civil society, there is need for deeper introspection. And we need to be very, very clear whether we want to be bureaucrats um, um, as well as professionals in this space, or we want to invest in mobilizing citizens to actually demand um, form of accountability. And for me, there lies the hope um, for consolidating our democracy over the next 20 years. So I'm going to ask Clement <coughs> about that, but I want to react to one or two things that you said. Um, you know, you mentioned uh, the checks and balances question again. And I remember in January of 2000, uh, Obasanjo was uh, preparing his budget and he submitted a multi-billion Naira amendment increasing the budget of the National Assembly. And the amendment was one page long. And the National Assembly did something very interesting. They said, we need a little bit more information before we allocate billions and billions of Naira to something which we don't know what it is. And there were a few other things that happened in those early years. The Niger Delta Development Commission was passed over riding a presidential veto. Um, these were you know, really important tests of those democratic institutions. I think Professor Osage is absolutely correct, though, that we have not seen those sort of storms weathered and those institutional capacities emerge at the state level. And this is very, very problematic, especially as the money and oil money and resources and revenue allocations will likely grow in the coming years to Nigeria's governors, uh, especially with the looming war in the Middle East among Saudi Arabia, Yemen, and Iran, and Syria. Um, you know, you also um, uh, mentioned mobilization, which is where we're going to go with Clement. Another interesting thing that I stumbled on in the research for my book was that there were age cohort differences that were statistically significant for trust in the Electoral Commission. Younger people in Nigeria are much less likely to trust INEC. And these are the sorts of things where it's not just bread and butter issues or your pocketbook issues that will mobilize people. These are the good governance issues. That is the next generation of protest. And this is something that's been identified as a growing trend across the African continent by the US Agency for International Development, by the National Intelligence Council, by scholars such as Pierre Engelbert and Lisa Miller. Um, there is a wave of protest sweeping the African continent and their demands are not food in my mouth, it is also, I want my ballot in the ballot box. Um, Clement, uh, how do you see that uh, mobilization perhaps playing out? Um, you know, 20 years ago, everyone seemed to be under this umbrella of the transition monitoring group. And um, now where is civil society and what are the possibilities for the vision that Samson's laying out? Thank you, Carl. Um, 20 years ago, and that picture is, there is, is 20 years ago, and that was me receiving uh, the Democracy Award from uh, uh, here in, in Washington on behalf of the Transition Monitoring Group. Uh, 20 years ago, um, the expectations were very high. Uh, 10 years before 20 years ago, in fact, slightly more than 10 years before 20 years ago, um, we had huge support from uh, here in Washington. And, uh, you know, Dave Peterson is here. Uh, he knew what we went through. He was part of the struggle for democracy in Nigeria. Uh, he was in, uh, in NED. Uh, Carl Gashman was here in NED, remains here in NED. And um, we know what it was 20 years ago, or even before that, uh, living in Nigeria. And um, it was a huge, huge struggle. Several of our colleagues who perhaps should be in this room discussing 20 years ago uh, were killed uh, by the dictatorship of uh, General Babangida, General Buhari, um, and, and um, General Sani Abacha. Those were very, very difficult years. And I remember sitting uh, in the house of a diplomat in Lagos waiting, and I think Ayo was in that uh, launch event as well, waiting for a colleague of ours to join us for lunch. Uh, we waited, waited, we couldn't start lunch. It was in the house of the Canadian ambassador. Uh, and a few minutes uh, just after we'd waited for so long, uh, we got the news that she had just been shot making her way to the lunch. Uh, she was killed on the streets of Lagos 
by General Sani Abacha's assassin, it's assass assassins. So it's been a very difficult uh, period for us in, in, in Nigeria. And we've come through 20 years of democracy, and uh, we know that the expectations were very high when uh, President Obasanjo took over office as president. Uh, and we know that he did very well in the first few years of his presidency. Uh, and then, of course, the challenges began of managing government and managing politics. And some of that uh, continues to uh, affect us uh, in, in Nigeria. Uh, like uh, Ambassador Greenfield said, I think there's been a lot of achievements, uh, a lot of achievements in the sense of where we have come from uh, in terms of the ability of um, the rule of law to improve. Um, in, in 20 years uh, or perhaps uh, slightly before that, a law was law simply because it was announced to be law. And whether you'd seen it or not, it was law. And people who hadn't seen the law were imprisoned. Uh, and then if, even if as a journalist you wrote the truth, if the truth embarrassed the powers that be, the government, you could be jailed. And we did have two very famous journalists, uh, Ndoke Rabo and Tunde Thompson, who were jailed, not because they wrote falsehood, but because they wrote the truth, and the president at the time was uh, embarrassed. Uh, so things have happened uh, to change so very much. Uh, you talked about uh, civil society organizations. 20 years ago, that term was never used in Nigeria. Uh, what was used was human rights organizations. Mm -hmm. uh, we later began to have non-governmental organizations, and today um, we do have what you call civil society organizations, which is a mild expression of what organized civil society uh, used to be. Uh, but it's positive that we've had so many more groups come up and uh, a lot of them led by young people who are doing so very much to expand the frontiers of uh, human freedoms uh, in, in Nigeria. Of course, we've had social media come up and so much has changed as well with social media. There's more communication, more people are aware of what is going on, more people are knowledgeable of what is going on. So in a lot of ways, uh, so much has changed. And uh, Professor Osage made, made the point about successive elections. We've had five, six successive elections in Nigeria. And a lot of that, uh, some have been positive, some not so positive. When you talked about the elections in 2007, uh, you know that was a disaster. Mm -hmm. In 2007, uh, and Dave, you were there, only 13 states out of 36 states had sent in the results, and the Electoral Commission announced the results of the election without figures and without any facts to back up that announcement. Elections since then have improved, and the most improved elections uh, since uh, our fourth republic was the elections in 2015, which everyone had judged to have been a major improvement on elections and reform of the electoral process. Uh, the question today is, where are we? <coughs> and if we begin to look at where we are today, we, we have to go back to the last elections. Um, we, we saw how the elections were so very tightly controlled uh, by the government in power that did not <coughs> give the kind of latitude that the government of President uh, Goodluck Jonathan gave to the Electoral Commission to be able to function. And so we had very well choreographed elections that were managed in ways that we had never seen by the military's interference in the electoral process. And people say that there's insecurity in the country, and so the military needs to be involved. Uh, but it was an election where the military was not just involved, but very active in, in getting involved in the election process. And I think that for all of us who have been observing elections, not just in Nigeria, but across the world, uh, when we see what happened with that elections and how very tightly controlled and manipulative the military was in uh, infiltrating our elections, and there's a major cause for worry. Um, the electoral laws are very clear. The elections have to be conducted by the Independent National Electoral Commission. The military has to take directives from the Independent National Electoral Commission. In the 2019 elections, that was not what happened. <coughs> and so in some cases, and indeed a lot of cases, the Electoral Commission was itself sandwiched between trying to do what was right and the overbearing presence and interference by the military in the elections. And so for all of us looking forward towards future elections <coughs> in the country, we must ask ourselves, where should we keep the military in terms of the next elections? Because if what happened in 2019 was to be left unattended to, 
then the 2020 elections would really just be um, uh, 2019 will be right uh, a child's play compared to what would happen in 2023. Uh, and so the threat of the military, which we thought was out of power since 1999, <coughs> has returned. And we must ask ourselves, how do we get the military back into the barracks and away from our elections? The influence of, of course, the elections, you have the judiciary, and, and Prof, you talked about the judiciary. There are serious threats to rule of law and the independence of the judiciary in Nigeria. One of the most unconstitutional actions that has happened in Nigeria in recent times was the removal of the Chief Justice of Nigeria without due process. There are procedures for removing the Chief Justice, and this is nothing to do with the allegations against him. It might just be true or not. not none of that was proved, and that's where the challenge of our democracy is, that you can almost single-handedly remove the chief justice of the country who heads the third arm of government in the country. I think that's a major challenge we have to ask ourselves. And to what extent the judiciary has become now subjected to the whims and caprices <coughs> of the government. The judiciary is beaten into line and it is unable to stand up for itself. And so a lot of times you find that opponents of government have to contend with a judiciary that is itself under serious pressure uh, from the government. We also look at, and something talked about this, the threats to free expression, indeed the threats to civil society. <coughs> uh, it is a major threat. It is a major threat. Civil society, uh, human rights organizations are being put on the back heel being put on the back hill because of the pressures of government. From the legislature, you do have a situation where the legislature at every new assembly is talking about regulating NGOs. Uh, several laws have been put forward by the legislature to regulate NGOs. The last attempt failed because of the massive challenge to it by civil society. Uh, in the last few weeks, there has been talk again about returning the country to uh, NGO uh, regulation regime, and I think it's something that we all need to see how we should do that. And I think when we look at all of the issues and looking forward, we need to see how we can um, strengthen civil society. You talked about um, uh, Omoyele Shore, who is very well known to this house and who has been very active in the democracy uh, front since the 90s. Uh, we know the threats that he is on, uh, or, um, been faced with. He's been in prison for more than three months simply because he raised concern about the state of governance in the country. In Nigeria, the government has a challenge of resources, and it is trying by every means to raise resources by taxing people incredible amounts of money for uh, programs that you don't see how it manifests on ground. New taxes are coming up for citizens. Businesses are shutting down because of the excessive taxation that is going on. So in terms of reflating and regenerating the economy, it's a major challenge for businesses in Nigeria. And the more businesses are facing this crisis and in fact shutting down, the more new taxes are coming up. And government is talking mm -hmm. today about increasing um, value-added tax. It's talking about increasing charges on bank transactions. So if you had money and you didn't want to spend it and you took it to the bank, you'll be asked to pay a tax for depositing your money in the bank. These are all huge challenges that is unprecedented. So in terms of the economy of the citizens, in terms of resource assets, in terms of the crisis of the economy, it's a major, major challenge. And the young people, the old people, everybody in the country is faced with these economic crises. But I think it's important for us as citizens. And coming from the experience that we had in the 80s and 90s, and you know, Ayo herself was blooded in that struggle, um, we know what the challenge is. And that is the fact that citizens have to be supported, have to be encouraged to make more demands on the government. Citizens have to be supported to challenge the arbitrariness that we see in the country today, the levels of human rights violation that have increased in recent times. This government in, in the country needs to function as a democracy, and citizens have a responsibility to challenge this government, to respect our democracy, and to function as a democracy, rather than looking back to years of military dictatorship and replicating and repeating 
some of the draconian measures that we saw under military regime, either because some people are looking back and thinking nostalgically about dictatorship. I think that the support that civil society got, and I'm happy that uh, the National Endowment for Democracy continues to provide support uh, to, to civil society in Nigeria. I think that support needs to continue, needs to be expanded, and citizens need to continue to be strengthened and supported to make the Manson government. We cannot go back, as they say, to, um, what's the expression now? Go back to Egypt. We have to... <laughs> Uh, look ahead and see how our democracy makes a meaning to us and how uh, young people, it's a youthful population in Nigeria. It's a population that has become much more aware than people were in the 80s and 90s. And I think that this population, this country must be saved. I'm not one of those that says that the country will go to ruins. I think that the country can survive, can come out from where it is. And we have a people who are united to make that demand and uh, support of groups like NED and other international organizations to the work that is going on in Nigeria is really crucial. Thank you. Thank you. And so um, I want to respond to that um, to try to connect that with some of the things that Samson was bringing up, past and present. Um, Ambassador Thomas Greenfield mentioned uh, possibly 30 uh, deaths in relation to the 2019 elections. and. The organization Election Monitor believes that the number may have been as many as 130. And so um, it's good to have sort of these comparisons to the past and the present and the next generation. And, and I, it's, I think it's important in a way that Samson um, is able to benefit from this knowledge transfer. It's also important that he's part of a new generation that has a new vision. You know, a turning point for me in my own research was um, interviewing a governor who recently joined Buhari's cabinet. And I began my conversation with him by asking him about the transition. And he said, well, I don't know. I wasn't there. And it was the first time that me and my role as this outside scholar, you know, had that kind of interaction. I thought that was good. And that's important because that's a source of optimism. Um, but... Um, you know, you've mentioned a number of important cases, and I don't want to steal the thunder from the following panel on human rights and democracy. But um, you know, I also note with passing um, Patrick Nag Nagmantan uh, from the Niger Delta, who did a tremendous amount of work to hold the oil companies accountable to promote environmental justice and development in the Niger Delta, and who was mysteriously killed or died a few weeks ago um, in an accident in the Niger Delta. So in addition to these incidents um, related to electoral violence or the horrible things happening right now today in Giwa Barracks, you know, we have these, violent, these incidents which also have these elements of uncertainty or a cloud of um, fear around them. Um, but this you know, should not also take away from the great progress that uh, Nigeria has made. So I, 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 I note uh, the markers that you've provided in those uh, other uh, ways. So last we'll hear from Ayo Obe, and then I'm sure we'll have some time for uh, question and answer. OK. Um, well, Clement, um, I, I share Clement's um, belief that Nigeria may not um, uh, will continue to survive. But if I may quote the Duchess of Sussex, Meghan Markle, it's not just about surviving. It's about thriving and prospering in your, um, uh, as, as you go forward. But I, I have to say that um, I have been um, also with um, Prof looking at it because we, we are here to talk about what the past 20 years has been about. And it does seem to me that in the past 20 years, we not only see how we have arrived here, but I think it's also because just looking back and telling the history of um, what's happened in the past 20 years, I'm not sure, I may call it Nigeria's democracy at 20, I wouldn't call it 20 years of democracy <laughs> necessarily. <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, if we look at how we have arrived here, um, we can also see some of the steps that we might have taken in the past 20 years and some of the things that are ha have been happening for the past 20 years and where they're going to take us in the next 20 years. So that um, uh, if I could, I mean, there's been talk about youth and so on. I'm not sure that Samson qualifies 
as a youth in the context of Nigeria's <laughs> overall population because um, we are facing a population explosion. The current projections are that we will be a nation of 500 million hmm. by the year 2050. And I think that um, so that when we discuss how are we going to meet that, we, we look at what have we done over the past 20 years, because the past 20 years, the issue of restructuring the nation, it's a, it's a ter term that means a lot of d different things to different people. But when we talk about restructuring, it's generally about less power at the center, more power at the states. And part of that discussion is a recognition in certain parts of the country that the population in other parts is going to outstrip them. And if we are still voting along identity basis, ethnicity, you mentioned ethnicity and age, we, religion is also a big part of it. If we are still voting along those lines, then there are some areas that will never see a presidency. At the same time, we've mentioned the fact that the huge number of people who don't vote in the elections. I mean, um, the ambassador talked about committed voters. Yes, the ones who turn out may be committed, but the ones who don't turn out vastly outnumber those who don't. I mean, I, I do a radio program and um, we had some of the candidates on. And um, uh, one of them who, was not, who did not belong to any of the major parties, um, famous film star in Nigeria, Banky W, I should say, and um, the question was, well, you know, how are you going to get over, you know, this issue? He said, look, in the last election for my constituency, the number, the, the, the margin between the winning candidate and the losing candidate was something like 30,000 votes. But the number of people registered to vote in that constituency was about 50,000 who didn't vote. So that he was going to be focusing on getting those votes out. He didn't succeed. And um, I think that when we talk about the youth and how we, we're really not speaking to them. My, um, in the last 20 years, we've had the rise of both, or we've had three particular um, Government treats them as criminals, but we, will we, we can see that they started at least in activism. And that's in the Niger Delta, in the Northeast, and in the Southeast. In the Niger Delta, you had the Niger Delta militants. Yes, their origins may have been that they were armed to fight the 2003 elections and then cast off to live off the land. And various other factors went into creating militancy in the Niger Delta. But that militancy has been, in a way, transformed into sending people to the um, National Assembly, sending people into the state assemblies. And generally, if you're running for office in parts of the country, you know that you, their, their votes are, to be, uh, are, are an issue that you have to face up to. Now, in the Southeast, there was a time when every politician who was serious in the Southeast was busy courting um, the leader of the independent people uh, of Biafra, um, Kanu. Kanu. Um, Namdi Kanu. They were courting him and saying, you know, he's talking sense. You had um, uh, a prominent senator stood um, show a tea for him when he was granted bail and so on. And why was that? Because Namdi Kanu was controlling the views of the youth in the Southeast. It's not that Namdi Kanu started off with money and all these other things that we think are vital. He just captured the zeitgeist for the youth in the part of the country that he was operating in. And incidentally, the youth in um, parts of Lagos State and other areas where you had a large Igbo population. And so the politicians realized that, ah, that if this chap is going to 
be so if, if effectual, then we better, you know, get him on board. But um, unlike his counterparts in the Niger Delta, and I use the word counterpart loosely because Namdi Kanu did not take up arms against the Federal Republic of Nigeria. There was no, I mean, there may have been low level, low level enthusiastic persuasion, but that's the same thing that we did when we were doing um, Villemort in the era of military. The fact is that he was not taking up arms, but he was controlling. But he said, we're not interested in Nigerian elections at all. And unfortunately, once you're not going to be politically relevant, then you can very easily become part of yesterday's story. So I think that um, if we are looking at how we've operated in the past 20 years, and then we look at how we're going to operate in the next 20, we need to think about why do, why, wha how is it that somebody like um, Kanu was able to so capture the imagination and support of the youth? Yes, there's an existing narrative, but the youth that he was um, talking about and was appealing to are not people who went through the Civil War. The Civil War ended in 1970. So the fact that he's still speaking to them and talking about Biafra and being and having resonance is something that when we put it in the in this um, idea of restructuring that is becoming attractive to a lot of Nigerians, it's something that we see. I mean, the government of President Jonathan did try to address the issue of restructuring, but it stopped at talking. When, re when recommendations came out, there was absolutely no action on those, on those recommendations. So I think that we, um, we, we I, I, I'm, not, I'm not necessarily somebody who knows how old people are and what, <laughs> whether they, I, I say that because I've, um, I've, something looks like a very substantial person to me. He's as young so as I, I, should, I should not, I should not, um, no, 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 people are not as young as they look, let me tell you. <laughs> and, um, speaking for myself. But really, to, um, to, to, to I, I think that because we have not, the, the youth have not been able to separate themselves out as a constituency. I mean, I remember attending in 2010 or so, the um, Chinua Achebe Colloquium, and it happened that at Brown at um, Brown is it Brown University in Rhode Island? Yes, anyway. yes, I was there, and it was very um, instructive how much enthusiasm there was for the candidacy that was to come of um, what's his name, Nuhu Ribadu, the. Um, the EFCC. former head of the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission. A lot of enthusiasm about his candidacy. He didn't win the election. I, I mean, he, he, he came what we might call a distant third. But there was that enthusiasm. Unfortunately, Nuhu Ribadu's response then was not to stay the path, but to, by himself, go out, as it were, naked into the PDP. And, you know, and I think that another thing that I've seen from the past 20 years is that you either go with your constituency or you become, um, uh, you become consumed by, at that time, the big story, the, the big dog at the table was the People's Democratic Party. But even if you go back into the A, um, what is it, APC, and you just go by yourself, you will still be, sw you'll be chewed up in the more. So that, whereas if your constituency, whether you're Namdi Kanu with IPOB or somebody else, if you go with your constituency, then you become a factor in the, um, in the political and democratic equation in Nigeria. Because what I've also observed over the past 20 years is that we are, dwindling, if I can use that expression, into a two-party system. And um, that's not necessarily because there are not different views. <coughs> if we look at the way that President Obasanjo, when he became president, I mean, we've talked about the National Assembly as a check and balance. 
Well, the National Assembly has been a check and balance, even though for most of its um, career, it's been controlled by the ruling party mm -hmm. at the executive. But in Obasa in Joe's time, I can't remember how many Senate presidents he went through. A lot. Um, because the National Assembly was not dancing to the executive tune. Um, the even the 2015 election, the National Assembly, because the plans of the APC for who would occupy the National Assembly top jobs did not come to fruition. And so the National Assembly did put a lot more scrutiny on whatever it was that the Buhari executive wanted to do. So what has happened in the past in terms of the National Assembly being a check and balance? We're not likely to see it as we go forward because this National Assembly knows very much that it owes its, the leadership owes its position to the ruling party, the ruling executive, and so on. Now, it may be that we get things done, I don't know. But um, we've seen at the state level where in most cases the, national, the, the state assemblies are indeed the um, creature of the state executive. I'm not sure that we can see that it has worked out so well for um, state assemblies. And incidentally, with regard, to, I, mean, I should say that, by the way, in Nigeria, the term impeachment in Nigeria means political removal or removal of a political um, person rather than sending for trial as it does mm -hmm. here, as you all may or may not be about to find out. So, um, the, so, so that the state assemblies have been very much the creature of their executives. We are now in a situation where the National Assembly may also be a creature, even though the opposition within the National Assembly is still going to be vocal, but whether it will be able to do more than have its say, I don't know. I mean, we talked about that huge increase in military spending. The fact is that at the time, because the National Assembly too said, sent Obasanjo's budget back to him and said that they want constituency projects. And Obasanjo was sort of like, constituency projects? What's that? that the executive is the one doing, <laughs> um, uh, wha wha what's the National Assembly doing with this? And the National Assembly, oh, we're not passing your budget if you don't sign it. And as it happened, fortunately or, or unfortunately, probably unfortunately, the price of oil had gone up. <laughs> and in the end, Obasanjo's attitude And so we have now got this huge industry of constituency projects, which are being carried out by the executive, quite all right, but they're nominated by the um, legislators. Yeah. And in fact, um, uh, the legislators who do the nominating have a lot more say than they would want you to believe when they're being asked to explain what's happening with their project. So that um, uh, the situation we are in now is that our uh, check and our balance. I'll just um, touch on the judiciary. Yeah, I'll just touch briefly on the judiciary to say that, yes, the judiciary is very much under strain. And yet, despite that, the judiciary is still trying to hold its corner. I don't know what will happen at the higher levels, but at the lower levels, I think the judiciary are still... Because they know that, in the end, if, you, if they cannot get you for corruption, then you will y th there's nothing really mm. that they can do except not promote you. Mm. So I don't, I'm speaking as a practicing lawyer, I don't have quite as little faith or confidence in the ability of the judiciary to find a way of upholding the rights of Nigerians. I'm not saying that they're the last hope of the common man, but I'm, I don't have quite as little faith as the fact that the Chief Justice was removed um, and then eventually resigned because he saw the writing on the wall. The, well, the writing had been written all over his face, <laughs> frankly. <laughs> but, you know, I, I don't hold quite as little confidence in that. So thank you, Ayo Obe, who's a legal practitioner. Um, and before I uh, lose your attention, I also want to uh, mention how important Egosa Asage's work was, his scholarly work. Um, in 1998, he published a book called Crippled Giant uh, with Indiana University Press. And uh, the story is that he was changing the title because he was afraid a bacho would get him in trouble. 
And one of our mutual friends called him when Abacha died and said, change back the title to a crippled giant. It's okay, you won't go to jail. And so I uh, commend this uh, really, really important classic seminal work of uh, Nigeria political science covering the years from 1960 to 1998. Um, I am really glad that you mentioned uh, the Southeast and the struggles there because that will become extremely important looking forward to 2023. Mm -hmm. And in 2017, I met with activists from the indigenous people of Biafra. Uh, and I also met with uh, past and present leaders of the uh, Igbo uh, elite pan Igbo organization, Ohenezi and Debo. And one thing that really struck me was exactly what you said, how Namadi Kanu had absolutely captured the imagination of these youth, but also that the elites were trying to capture that mobilization okay. of the youth. And so the question is, how do they stand on their own um, and be their own autonomous, authentic voice? And, and this is what I hear you articulating. It's a very, very important question and perhaps a burden for Samson to carry. I don't know. <laughs> um, so we only have round for one round of questions. It's a big panel with a lot of ideas. So please keep your questions very, very, very brief. We'll take uh, a question from this side of the room and uh, a question from uh, this side of the room, um, uh, wow, lots of hands. Um, I'll go with Deirdre Lupin, whose hand okay. was uh, up first, and then this gentleman uh, in the back, well into Washington, and then we'll have quick responses, and we'll move Hope to the next identifying panel. ourselves? My name is Deirdre Lupin. I was actually a lecturer at uh, UNIFE in 1975, and uh, between then and now, I've been in and out of Nigeria for about 15 years, doing various activities for multilateral, bilateral organizations and also the private sector. Um, my, I, I was very happy to hear Ayo mention the restructuring because during this last 20 years, that's a, been a very important subject. And of course, for the National Conference of 2014 and then the El Rufai study that was done later, I was wondering for any one of you who would like to respond, what your view of the potential for restructuring might be because it seems that it's kind of a, we're in a waiting pattern to see if there's going to be a discussion of restructuring and that is going to, in many people's minds, resolve the whole problem of sort of uh, capture of institutions by cabals and, and corrupt individuals, et cetera, and will open the door to better social services for the ordinary Nigerian, et cetera. Um, I'd just like to hear what prospects you see for restructuring. Mm -hmm. let, let me just say that the point about political restructuring is that because of the demographic um, imbalance that we see growing, people expect that if we don't have more autonomy at the state level, then we will be perpetually under the domination of whether it's the Fulanis or the Islamization or whatever it is. So that whether, however real that is or not real, it's a factor which is now informing. I, I should say that my law partner is um, very much involved in, it's, it's his whole raison d'etre for supporting this party rather than that party. And I do think that it's, um, I think that it's not something that we can, we can leave. Uh, just on the last one, the question is always, um, we have a saying in um, the part of Nigeria that I come from, which is that if gold rusts, what will iron do, okay? Because we see the democracy in the US presented to us as the gold standard. Mm. And if the gold is seen to be perceived to be rusting, my answer is that we should develop ourselves some good old stainless steel because we need to actually stop giving excuses about where they're failing there or they're not failing here and have our own policy for ourselves. The President of the United States is in the end the President of the United States, not the President of Nigeria mm. or Africa. Mm. Can, I, can I just um, contribute to this and, and what Ayo talked about the state. I think beyond the state we need to look at the local government's um, administration because um, we, we th there's a great need to strengthen local governance. So when we talk about restructuring it's about devolution of power but also looking at our democratic institutions like the National Assembly. There are conversations on whether we, this bicameral legislature that we have is, is sustainable. Why not we 
adopt um, a unicameral um, legislature. These are critical issues that um, require um, deeper reflection. But I'd like to just piggyback on what Ayo said about young people not necessarily, if I get to carving their identity um, for themselves. I, I think that if you look at just the sustenance of democracy over the last um, 20 years, there are three key events that it's, it's worth highlighting. First was when we lost President uh, Musa Yaradua um, and um, before Jonathan was sworn in. It took young people who went to the streets um, to actually place that demand. Um, uh, save Nigeria. I, I was also there and I'm not young. <laughs> Yeah, but, but, majority of, the but majority of the people who went to the streets were young people. If you look at um, even um, what budget, for instance, is doing with um, decentralizing and um, information, these, even though they are young people who, who are um, leading this, if you look at the not too young to run struggle as well, in fact, in just the 2019 elections, um, we directly mobilized over 25,000 young people to get on the voters register in just six tertiary institutions. And so, yes, there's so much that needs to be done with respect to youth mobilization and youth engagement, but I don't agree that young people are, all, mo all young Nigerians are docile and young people are not getting involved. I'm not saying you said so, but I'm just saying, because <laughs> I don't want us to live with the impression that um, young people in Nigeria are not making any efforts towards consolidating um, our, our democracy. I think it was what um, highlighted. What U.S. policy now grapples with is um, how to really live up to its standards of human rights. And I hope that the voices that the U.S. government um, and others here in Washington heard today, straight from Africa, straight from Nigeria, will really lend some credence to those concerns about uh, human rights and the threat to democracy. And the last thing I would say is that um, I think Western governments in general still really struggle with what to do with a deeply, deeply flawed election. Mm -hmm. And that is a burden that is on uh, those Western governments where when we hear from Clement and Sampson and, and others about how bad or problematic an election was, um, I think they're still trying to figure out what to do. And this is where our alliance is and our willingness to listen to civil society voices and the people and the grassroots becomes really, really critical for defending democracy everywhere. Thank you very much. Thank you.